Welcome back to Azure Fun Bites. My name is Jay Gordon. Today we're going to talk about artificial intelligence on Azure. Let's get into it. Artificial intelligence, or AI, empowers amazing new solutions and experiences, and Microsoft Azure provides easy-to-use services to help you get started. Machine learning is a concept where you bring together data and an algorithm to solve a specific need. Data modeling is the process of producing a descriptive diagram of relationships between various types of information that are to be stored in a database. Microsoft Azure provides the Machine Learning Service, a cloud-based platform for creating, managing, and publishing machine learning models. Azure Anomaly Detector provides you with an API to allow developers to create anomaly detection solutions. The Anomaly Detector API enables you to monitor and detect abnormalities in your time series data without having to know machine learning. A cognitive service provides part or all of the components in a machine learning solution, data, algorithm, and trained model. These services are meant to require general knowledge about your data without needing experience with machine learning or data science. Microsoft Azure provides cognitive services for things such as image recognition with computer vision, face detection, speech to text services, and many more. Hi, I'm Andy Pollack. I'm a cloud advocate here at Microsoft. AI enables us to build amazing software that can improve healthcare, enable people to overcome physical disadvantages, empower smart infrastructure, create incredible entertainment experience, and even save the planet. Conversational AI is the term used to describe solutions where AI agents participate in conversations with humans. Most commonly, conversational AI solutions use bots to manage dialogues with users. Azure services like Q&A Maker and Azure Bot Service allows developers to create real-time agents via AI to help their customers. This is just a start into your AI journey. Why don't you go ahead and just click this link for more documentation and even $200 in free Azure credit. My name's Jay Gordon. We'll see you next time on Azure Fun Bites. And that right next time just happens to be now. Hey, how's it going? It's Jay. Welcome back to Azure Fun Bites. Uh, it's good to have you again every week uh, or, or almost every week. We do this. And what do we do? We talk about the different fundamentals that make up Microsoft Azure. And so this week, uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the things that you can do with Azure. And they're not just servers. It's not just uh, compute. It's not just storage. Now we start talking about ways to uh, manipulate uh, data into maybe even more uh, human readable, accessible formats because we allow machines to do some of the uh, reading, listening, talking, uh, viewing, you name it. Uh, we, we can have that done using services like uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. Now, uh, I needed some help to get through this. Now, I, I, I went through the docs, I did a bunch of stuff, but I'll be real, I'm, I'm still kind of a, you know, a servers person. That's where I come from. And so uh, getting to know these technologies takes a little bit for me. And so because of that, I wanted to bring along someone who I think understands this both from the ops side but also can get uh, a little bit more from the uh, the side of the AI and, and understanding. So I have today with me uh, Anthony Bartolo. Anthony, uh, how you doing? Good yourself. I I feel like I'm doing really good today. Uh, you know, it's a little uh, cooler here in New York uh, today, but you know, I'm I'm I really am loving the sun, so I I can't really complain much. Well, us both being in the East Coast, it's just as cool as up here uh, as it is down there here in Toronto, uh, maybe mm -hmm. a couple degrees colder. But other than that, sun shines out, so it's a good day. Yeah, you really can't complain. Uh, the, these days, while they're a little crisp, it's getting that like nice kind of you know time in the sun that lets you enjoy that little chill. You know, maybe the for me it's the the shorts and hoodie season that uh, I, I thrive in. Uh, <laughs> So speaking of thriving, uh, you really thrived a lot at Microsoft, haven't you? Um, I've been lucky. I've been lucky a lot. Um, I've been, you know, able to integrate myself with the audiences that are out there. Um, I've been uh, able to, you know, speak to the community and, and, and gain ideas and learn from the community as well. Mm -hmm. I think we've done a lot of growing as an organization as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. I did come back from the days of, hey, these are servers that you have to go out there and, and, and 
install in your at your organization. Then we move to the cloud, and we move to enablement of uh, your information on devices securely, seamlessly. Uh, went from securing a device to securing an identity. Like it's been an, a very exciting journey uh, mm -hmm. in regards to my time here at Microsoft and just the amount of evolution that I've been able to experience was really cool. Well, that's great. You know, I, I feel like as a, as a member of like the, the bigger advocacy team at Microsoft, you, you really begin. And I say this almost every time I, I'm on with someone, uh, you know, we, we have such a deep bench. You know what I mean? We have so many like smart people who are really uh, into doing great things and people who are also adaptive. You know, I feel like that's one of the things that I can really feel that our team does is we adapt well to situations, to places, to things. And adapting is something that uh, AI is really, really great at. And so um, I have begun uh, a little bit of a journey into uh, learning about the AI services that uh, Microsoft Azure has. And while I am not too sure about everything, I think you're going to be able to help me a little bit more. Uh, so first and foremost, how did you kind of make that transition to start using some of these technologies that exist? Here's the thing. I, like you, I, you know, started with servers, right? I mm -hmm. see myself as an IT professional, system administrator, deploying integrating you have it right and then enabling mm -hmm. the developer to accomplish what they need to accomplish sure what i've learned is you also have to put your feet in other people's shoes to understand the troubles and, and issues that they're running through in order Absolutely. to best help them out in regards to what their asks are and to do so um, i was lucky enough to be embedded into projects um, here at microsoft at another uh, another time in my career uh, that mm -hmm. allowed me to work directly with customers alongside developers in a real world proof of concept uh, to build out these solutions. That for me, I, I learned by hands on. You may have heard of that before. Um, mm -hmm. I learned very much from hands on. Uh, and, and what I was amazed at was the amount of resources that were available even back then. It's, it's grown astronomically since then. But even back then, there were a lot of step by step instructionals that were available that allowed you to grasp at least the, the concepts in terms of AI, what that meant, whether mm -hmm. it be cognitive, custom vision, sentiment analysis, whatever that may be. But it was also a way to do it in a real world implementation that would have purpose, that would have impact. And so it became more important than just going through the steps to add on a service. It was, how are you curtailing the service to meet the demands and needs of the uh, organization that you're working with to build out this proof of concept to then be shared with the world. So like, like I just said, you know, it, it sounds like we at, in our team and, and on teams at Microsoft, we, we tend to be very adaptive. And so it sounds like you just did that. You, you were in a situation where you needed to adapt uh, your whatever work you were doing beyond just what you knew of uh, IT operations and integrating, you know, networks and, and, and into uh, the cloud, I think that it, it gave you the insight that, uh, especially when you're talking to people who are moving from traditional data centers into the cloud, talking to people how to adapt their technology is extremely important. I think that those like conversations aren't always easy to have. And I think that when you put your, uh, your feet in someone else's shoes and you take a walk and you're able to find out what they need, it, it helps you better provide a lot of that though also deals with the approach so mm -hmm. when i first started out working full-time i was actually a mechanic uh okay. at a little little known shop up north called canadian tire and um it was a lot of the problem solving uh that really intrigued me with technology in regards to what you can accomplish this this came mm -hmm. at a time when the ecu was was made available in vehicles and mm -hmm. at that time, I was connecting via the OBD, OBD2 port through serial port on a 486 computer uh, and being able to pull out diagnostic. Yes, I just dated myself, uh, uh -huh. pull out diagnostics from the vehicles. And that was intriguing to me in terms of the possibilities back then in terms of what we can accomplish. Right. Fast yeah. forward, you know, some some time now, the problem scaling, the problem uh, solving skills that I amassed while as a mechanic, which I still dabble in vehicles to this day. Um, mm -hmm. is, is so important to me and is a cornerstone for me when I'm addressing opportunities. 
don't think of it as how I'm going to, am I, am, how am I going to apply the technology to my organization to make money or to save money? It's mm -hmm. how do I harness technology to address the opportunities or problems that I've uncovered to enable that solution, right? That for me was a big mind shift in terms of don't add on technology for the sake of adding on technology. And I hear it all the time. If I rub AI on my insert product here, I'm going to make money. Or I'm going to save somebody money. It's, and, and I've always said, be, be careful about that because mm -hmm. you want to harness it in such a way that's going to enable. You want to harness it in such a way that's going to enable your organization to grow beyond the boundaries of what you thought you wanted to accomplish. Doing the problem solving methodology for myself was important in terms of the proper adoption of AI services and for something that provided longevity when the proof of concept has been completed to go to actual production. Hmm. Well, you know, we're really lucky to have you here this week, Anthony. And uh, I just wanted everyone who's possibly watching in the chat, um, if, if you got questions for us, uh, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, we'll see if we can get uh, either myself or Anthony to get you some questions answered. Um, but first, I think we can get into uh, what our main subject is going to be for today, and that's um, AI. And I think uh, what I want to do is to kind of get us started. I want to just show everybody uh, a little short that I think will uh, kind of explain uh, a lot in, in, in just a little bit of words. So let's give it a watch, all right? Oop, yeah, there we go. It's just opened up this whole world. The future we invent is a choice we make. So that that's a quick video uh, that's from actually this uh, module that I kind of wanted to introduce everyone uh, here this week if we're going to talk about all this. I think it's really cool to start with uh, where we kind of get started from, and that's from the Microsoft Learn uh, fundamentals around AI. And so, as always, like I say, we talk about fundamentals on the show, and Anthony, I think these are some of the great fundamentals that we can kind of get started off in here. Yeah, what I love about this module is it does run you through the whole premise of what you're trying to accomplish in incorporating AI. And it mm -hmm. does so in such a way where it starts at the grassroots. What is artificial intelligence? How does it break out to the different services from machine learning to cognitive services, so on and so forth. And when you get to it, my favorite part is the hands-on part where it uses inside of Microsoft Learn, the sandbox technology, the ability to actually deploy services like machine learning and others on Azure in real time uh, in the sandbox, which doesn't require you to have an Azure subscription. It only, allow, it only requires you to have a Microsoft account. So you set up, sign up for your account and you go in and you can actually do hands-on work on deploying you know, solutions to machine learning, solutions to cognitive services on and on. 
So that gives me a little bit of what we're going to do. So I think today what we're going to do real quick, Anthony, is we're going to go through this module, uh, which gives everybody kind of a good introduction to what you're eventually going to help us demo. Um, and so I want to kind of just get everybody the basics of what exactly uh, is AI on Azure. And so we're going to talk about these services, machine learning, uh, anomaly detection, computer vision, natural language processing, and conversational AI. Um, and, and I think what we'll do, Anthony, is we'll, we'll just step through the modules and we'll just talk about it briefly as we step through. Sound good to you? Cool. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. So we're going to go here to machine learning. And and I thought this is really cool. It, we've all kind of seen this watch football. Right now, artificial intelligence helps us meet the needs of today so we're prepared for tomorrow. By 2050, we need to produce 60% more food. So how are we going to feed the world without wrecking the planet? Using Microsoft artificial intelligence we can reduce waste and produce more food. Any grower will tell you every row, every crop is different. We can use Microsoft AI to make local predictions about light, wind, rain. This helps farmers know when to plant, irrigate and harvest. It's making a difference. Artificial intelligence helps farmers grow more while wasting less. So I really like that example a lot. I love it, and and I think it's going to help me kind of lay this up for uh, everyone. Um, here's what I know, Anthony. You can and I, I kind of made it in my video that I do the little intro video. Machine learning is essentially one big search of a database with a whole lot of interesting algorithms in that search to give you some information based on the data. Am I really dumbing it down? No, um, I want to add a little bit to that though. So okay. the search piece in essence is the algorithm. So the algorithm that you're creating in essence is your is your search command. What are you actually looking for? What are the, What is the outcome that you're trying to, uh, to find? And when you're using that algorithm to search through your data, it's pulling out the information in regards to themes. So, you know, if it's in a cognitive uh, piece or a vision piece, uh, the difference between a dog and a cat and the different attributes of each, each animal would have. It's, it's that algorithm, which is in essence your search. So it's not just, you know, going and said, find me cat. The algorithm is going through your data based on what your requirements are, mm -hmm. to pull out the information specifically to what is a cat and what is a dog. Gotcha. So uh, machine learning services in Microsoft Azure, we've got uh, automated machine learning. Um, this feature it, it enables non-experts to quickly create an effective mean machine learning model from data. Okay, so I'm guessing that means you're providing a bunch of data uh, and it's making some predictive models without really having to write any code. Am I kind of getting that? So What's great about it is that you, in, in the tool itself that Microsoft provides, it's a, it's a workbench and you're mm -hmm. actually feeding in your data into the workbench and then you're using pre-programmed algorithms that are made available, regressive and, sure. so, and so forth to out, have an outcome of your data. You still need to know what algorithm is required to pull out, to have your specific or desired outcome made available. Um, but again, that's something that's made available without code. What I love about it is once you've tested out your solution, you've, you've you know, got the response that you were looking for, you can actually extract that as an API and embed that into code in future uh, to have desired outcomes on other data that may not pass through the workbench itself. So if I say had a, a database that was full of just like what people's favorite color was and at what place in the world they live and at what time of the day they told you uh, their, their favorite color, I could eventually ask the question of, what's the favorite color in North Dakota at 5 p.m.? And, and I think I could be, get an answer, am I right? So you would get an answer. Um, the challenge with that is it's data that's already been created. In, okay. in the use of machine learning, what you wanna do is you wanna predict future data. So one of my first projects that I actually worked on uh, was taking mousetraps and connecting them to Raspberry Pis for the outcome of uh, understanding 
where was the best places to put the mice, the mouse traps to catch the most mice. Gotcha. And so what we were doing was the data that was being captured was capturing and placement of the traps throughout the, the warehouse that we were putting them in and understanding, feeding the information to machine learning where the trap was placed inside of the warehouse, how many times the trap was set off, how many times was the trap cleared. Uh, and in gaining that information, the pushing it through machine learning, it came up with a predictive model to say, in this warehouse, if you place the traps in these exact spots, you're going to catch the most mice. <laughs> and so now that goes into our next thing is the great thing about when you're working with machine learning is when you're constantly having data that, that is, is fairly consistent that you're expecting, you can use services to start finding out when things go awry. And so I really love the car racing scenario. Um, I've seen uh, a talk from a person that worked in an F1 team. I, I forgot it. It was years ago. And, and they talked about how machine learning specifically, uh, oh, I think I lost Anthony. Uh, well, anyway, I'll, I'll continue my story until Anthony gets back. Um, they they kind of talked about how machine learning and anomaly detection was uh, made it capable for the, uh, the, the, the team that ran the car uh, to essentially tell when certain portions needed to be brought into the pit and changed. Uh, so I got Anthony back. Let me just bring it back in. I apologize. Hey, I'm running into some technical difficulties here. I'm in the midst of getting new hardware and the old hardware is failing on me. So uh, sorry about that. No problem. Anyway, I was just talking about this uh, race car scenario about uh, anomaly detection. And so when you're having a lot of data and you uh, it's fairly predictive, you want to go and find ways to find out when the things that are supposed to happen aren't happening and it's more like that it's not when a thing a new thing happens it's when a thing that's not it, it it's not even about the new thing it's about the thing that is consistent has been uh disrupted am i kind of right yes i actually i love the race car example just because i am a car guy myself um here so think of this scenario when a formula one car nascar whatever that may be driving around the track you want to make sure that this car is in optimal condition to win the race right? There's a lot of factors that are in play in regards to the tires, to the driver, to the, you know, the, the, the fluidity of the steering, to how much gasoline you have in the vehicle. One of the biggest factors is weight. So weight of the vehicle really matters in regards to uh, whipping around the track as fast as possible with the least amount of weight on your back. The mm -hmm. easiest way to, to achieve this is the addition and removal of gasoline. Now, there's a lot of factors in regards to gasoline inside of the vehicle and you're, when you're racing around the track. You obviously want to have enough gas for the amount of laps that you want to accomplish, uh, but you also don't want to have an overage of gas uh, because then it'll weigh you down and make you slower. And a tenth of a second in, in racing is, is always important. So what can be done in the predictive model is understanding the environment. So the, the racetrack that you're racing at, is it a windy day? Is it a sunny day? Is it a rainy day? If it's a rainy day, what tires are you, are you running? Are you running tires with, with treads? Are you wearing, running uh, slicks? All those uh, that are in all that information is being imported into machine learning. And so the machine learning will provide you the optimal output in terms of, well, for your car and the setup in the current environment, this is what you should be running in terms of gasoline. This is what, mm -hmm. what the tires you should be running. This, you know, a lot of the teams that in racing right now are, are capitalizing on this to ensure that the, the vehicle is as prepared as possible. And, and it brings it down to just, you know, the, the last aspect of the vehicle itself is the, is the, the driver. Uh, in mm -hmm. regards to their experience in driving out, which can also provide, uh, there is a predict predictability model in re that respect as well, in terms of the driving line that the driver should adhere to uh, while they're on the track to uh, to ensure optimal speed and, and to, to win the race, right? It, it's such an interesting uh, experiment to run through in terms of the, the whole car uh, racing piece uh, in regards to machine learning and the amount of possibilities that are out there to accomplish. So another big thing that machine learning can do for us is use models to um, understand photographs, images, pictures, whatever you want to call it, and then make a determination on what they are. So let's take a look at this real quick of one of those particular uh, pieces of software that's using this kind of technology. Seeing AI is a Microsoft research project for people with visual impairments. The app narrates the world around you by turning the visual world into an audible experience. Point your phone's camera, select a channel, and hear a description. 
The app recognizes saved friends. Jenny near top right, three feet away. Describes the people around you, including their emotions. 28-year-old female wearing glasses looking happy. It reads text out loud as it comes into view, like on an envelope. Ken Lawrence, P.O. Box. Or a room entrance. Conference 2005. Or scan and read documents like books and letters. The app will guide you and recognize the text with its formatting. Top and left edge is not visible. Hold steady. Lease agreement. This agreement exit. When paying with cash, the app identifies currency bills. 20 US dollars. When looking for something in your pantry or at the store, use the barcode scanner with audio cues to help you find what you want. Campbell's tomato soup. When available, hear additional product details. Heat in microwave full on height. And even hear descriptions of images in other apps like Twitter by importing them into Seeing AI. A close-up of Bill Gates. Finally, explore our experimental features, like scene descriptions, to get a glimpse of the future. I think it's a young girl throwing a frisbee in the park. Experience the world around you with the Seeing AI app from Microsoft. I, I love that video because I love the use case of, of that. And I think, uh, this is one of the coolest things uh, that I've seen come out of machine learning uh, is the ability to help people kind of navigate the world who may have, um, you know, vision uh, impairment or hearing impairment or, or one of those things. I think it's been really interesting as I've kind of started reading a little bit more about the different APIs, the actual use cases. And I think you're going to show me a use case today. Yep. But I, I love this, and we'll get into that in just a minute. I just want to give everybody a quick rundown because I want to give us time for you to show us your demo and stuff. So I'm going to run through this real quick. Um, the next thing we talk about is the computer vision models and capabilities. There's a few different services that are able to uh, do face detection, optical character recognition, image analysis, which I think is, is amazing. This A person with a dog on a street. The fact that um, an API, it, it literally an API that you go to, uh, it is able to kind of read uh, a, a photo or an image and then make this determination. It's it's really incredible to me. Even the semantic segmentation, uh, segmentation about how everything isn't one big blob, how it knows that everything is a separate piece and those elements make up a single image to me is just, it's really awesome. Uh, object detection, so actually being able to tell what those things are, not just that they're segmented, but actually then make determinations of what they are and then classify them into specific things. So I kind of went backwards because I think it's important to kind of think of it. This is the big, big stuff. And then we get down to the like very, very smallest element of the individual object. So that's kind of it. And we can do it through a couple different services. Uh, computer vision, uh, custom vision, where you actually, I think that's where you provide all the images yourself, right? Correct. And that's the demo I'm actually going to show. Very cool. Uh, and then uh, there's obviously this uh, face service where you can actually do uh, face detection, uh, facial res recognition, and then a form recognizer. Uh, so we'll go over to natural language processing. NLP is essentially the kind of things where uh, you can interact uh, with, with, with computers and they'll understand you. So I, I'm going to show you this. Uh, it is super rad. And then after this, we're going to finish up and then get into Anthony's demo. Sound cool? So think about this. How often are you alive? when the dawn of a new medium comes out. I knew that I had to be a part of VR because there are no rules for what VR should be. Starship Commander is a choose your own adventure VR narrative that uses natural language processing. So you can actually have a real conversation with the characters. I'm Sergeant Sarah Pearson. I've been assigned to your wing today. When we started making Starship Commander, we had to figure out how do we get technology that can understand what a person's saying so that we can have these new narrative experiences? We're a science fiction game. We with new words. No off-the-shelf software 
could let us put in custom words. Who are the Echnians? In our story, the bad guys are called the Echnians. And every time we said Echnian, it would come up with really weird words that were similar to other things that you would say. And so it would get confused all the time. So we needed to make sure that we could supply our own script. We started using Microsoft Cognitive Services to power the back end of Starship Commander. Looks cool. Once we plugged custom speech service into Starship Commander, I had tears in my eyes when I was playing it because it's like, oh my, God. <laughs> oh my God, this is it. This is the experience we want. Open the hatch. Voice print accepted. Welcome, Commander. You can essentially put your script in there and it knows, oh, these are the ways that people are going to talk. And these are the phrases they're going to say. Cool. What's my mission? It must be something pretty important. And then the second thing, too, was the intent detection. With Lewis, you basically give it a couple statements. After you've given it a couple statements, you crunch it and you start typing in your own statements. And it's shockingly scary how good it picks up, even stuff that you didn't put in there. Computer, use autopilot and let's be on our way. Autopilot engaging. I've never seen an opportunity like this where there's a wide open playing field. No one's written the rules yet. There's gonna to be tons of amazing software out there and I just can't wait to see what other people write. I love it. I think that's like one of the coolest use cases of some of these that I've seen so far. Just like the idea that now we got video games that are cooler because of AI. <laughs> um, so we, we've got text analytics, uh, translator text, speech where it, it can synthesize and recognize speech, uh, which we just saw, uh, understanding intelligent uh, language and understanding intelligent service, which was also a huge thing we just saw. So that you can, it, video games can understand what you're talking to them about. That's, that's insane. And so there's a cool demo if you want to check them out. Uh, and then, then finally, I think almost anyone here, and I'm, I'm not going to bother to show a video on this. Um, let's say you order something uh, and you haven't gotten an update on the order. You go to the website and you see a little thing on the right and it says, check with the automated agent and find out about your order. And then you can just authenticate provide an order number, and then a robot will basically look into their database, get the information, and bring it back to you. That's like the thing that we've all been kind of dreaming of lately about, like when it comes to reducing how much consternation you have to go through when just dealing with a customer service situation. It's cool. That actually combines two services. Uh, Lewis, in terms of understanding what was in, in the speech that we're providing to the solution to find out that information and the bot framework. So the bot framework is that tool that allows you to build that automated attendant to respond to your customers when there's uh, challenges or inquiries that they're putting forward. Um, the Both tools can be incorporated very quickly and with very minimal code because of the fact that they're using um, the, the workbench scenario, the workbench platform to build out the solution. Uh, I've worked with a couple of um, rescue agencies here in Canada uh, mm -hmm. for pets. Uh, in regards to, you know, rehoming pets and using the whole bot framework to address FAQ questions that come in frequently, uh, literally took half an hour to incorporate an entire FA FAQ database into the bot framework to spit out responses in regards to, you know, if if you found pet, oh, sorry, if an if a animal is found, what do you do? Uh, who do you report it to? What is the next course of action? If the animal is injured, like the whole FAQ that was made available um in ingested directly into the bot framework lewis sure. was automatically attached to understand if i'm asking hey i just found a dog and it looks like it's limping what should i do it providing you the response in terms of what what the next step should be which that's, is really that's, cool and that's that's really really great stuff and then we being able to just get information on the fly without having to deal with waiting on hold or, or waiting for a response. I think it's just really awesome. So it's just really smart use case. Um, and so to kind of round out our, our Microsoft Learn module, um, responsible AI is a really, really important conversation that we have when it comes to uh, ethical uses of technology. 
And I believe that the one thing that we can always remember with uh, AI is that computers don't understand nuance. It is not part of what computers do. They are artificially intelligent to a point of you provide them with something and it can only give you back information based on the data you provide. And that includes if you provide algorithms that don't make uh, notice of people's differences, uh, especially with facial recognition. Uh, and, and I believe there have been services that uh, like make determination uh, about your, your higher ability based on scanning your face and things like that. And, and so all that said, I think people always have to kind of consider if you use these systems, what exactly are you going to do to make sure that what you put in a, a, has a, a fair response that comes out? So. so at Ignite, I actually had the opportunity to sit down with uh, the ethics group here at Microsoft in terms of the best practices and in, in adoption of AI. And there's a full on resource that Microsoft offers in terms of the proper use of AI. So you're not alone in terms of the discoverability of this. Um, from my previous experience uh, working with an organization called the Missing, Ch Missing Children's Society of Canada, we harnessed AI to understand sentiment analysis and conversation that was happening on social between a child and a, uh, a possible abductor and mm -hmm. all the conversations that were occurring. What we learned really quickly was you can gra you grab the information seamlessly from social, but is it ethical to do so? Do you need permission to grab information from the child's account to do the sentiment analysis? And mm -hmm. yes, 100% you do. And, you know, thinking that just because it's open you know, into the public in terms of the information that you're sharing on Twitter, on Facebook, on any social platform, you don't own the rights to that content. It is owned by the, the creator, the, the person who's pushed out that tweet. And so to do sentiment analysis on that, you have to get their permission to do so. This is you know, the learnings that we actually came across working with Missing Children's Society of Canada and the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police to understand that just grabbing the information and doing the sentiment analysis is not enough. You actually have to also acquire permission from the child or from the child's parents if they're under the age of 18 here in Canada uh, to actually do the sentiment analysis on that account. So that's where we created the whole registry piece that either the child or the parents can register on the child's behalf in order to monitor uh, the, the conversations. And even in that respect, the monitoring couldn't be 24 seven. The monitoring mm -hmm. had to be invoked by the child or by the parent uh, using the hashtag HFM. So if they put hashtag HFM on Twitter, uh, on Facebook, or on Instagram, immediately all the um, information that pertains to that account is analyzed for sentiment analysis to understand, here, here's your possible abductors that have been talking to this child for X amount of months that you should investigate into. Interesting, interesting. And so we're going to talk about cognitive services, and you're going to demo something for it. And so before we do that, we're just going to take a look at this kind of intro to the cognitive services that Azure provides. Azure Cognitive Services are AI capabilities that drive business impact through rich end user experiences. With just a few lines of code, you can bring computer vision to the factory floor or give e-commerce experiences a human touch. You can empower companies to spot anomalies in real time, hospitals to extract critical data from patient records, and people across the world to communicate with each other. You can deploy AI where you need it most, from the cloud to the intelligent edge, using the programming languages you already know. No machine learning experience necessary. To get started, simply explore our services and begin creating intelligent solutions that meet your business and end user needs. Very cool. So it, it, it's, it's just like we've been talking about. It's a suite of services that get us to what we need to do using the AI uh, capabilities in Azure. And so I think you got something to show us that yes, could kind of show that off. So why don't you roll out the old desktop and let's let's take a look at what you got to show me. All right. And uh, I, I know um, one of your things that you like to kind of mess around with are drones, am I right? I do. Uh, kind of can see behind you at least one drone, I think. There, there's a couple of robots back there, but yes, there is one drone. Um, this one right here uh, it was just a interesting 
toy to play with in the fact that it uses JavaScript to actually run the operations of the uh, drone itself. And it's non-programmer or non-developer friendly in the fact that everything is drag and drop in terms of the operations. Actually, a lot of the robots that are behind me are drag and drop coding. Um, so don't think you know, you're know, you limited by, I don't have background in programming knowledge. You actually start to acquire that as you go forth and, and start dabbling with these solutions. Um, so definitely go out and grab a kit and start dabbling with it if you're interested in it. Don't, don't be hesitant. Oh, I'm not a developer, I can't do this. Of course you can, uh, and the tools are out there for you. So what I want to bring to light is one of the proof of concepts that we built out with an organization um, called Indro Robotics based here in, in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, they had an idea to harness drones to help with search and rescue. The mm -hmm. big thing with this story is previously they would fly these gas powered drones with a pilot that would be in a central office uh, out to three hours at, at sea to observe an area and then fly the drone back. Mm -hmm. They couldn't send out emergency services until the drone had flown back to the central office and had the video analyzed by a person uh, to, to d deduct what do we actually uh, got to do when we get out there. So initially, when they came to us uh, to build out a proof of concept, what they actually wanted to, what, to accomplish was how do we take this, the video feed and compress it to, to something that can handle a, like a 14, 14 four kilobits per second transmission so sure. that we can understand what we're looking at in terms of the emergency services so that we can get emergency services out there sure. that much quicker. You're going over cellular networks. And right. So you have to adjust the video to, you know, you can't push over 4K video of a, a, a even though those beautiful cameras are capable of it. That's for after the fact. Um, well, so. here's the thing, though, right? There's a couple things that you have to keep in consideration for uh, regulatory. The fact that the drone flying out there, it can't come back with imagery that's under a certain megapixel. So even though you have a 14, four kilobit connection, your video can't degradate in regards to what's being seen because things will be missed. So taking the existing stream and the bandwidth that they, they, they required and doing compression on it didn't make sense because to degradate the video that much mm -hmm. would put it out of compliance for the requirement the drone was purpose for to help find people when they're in distress out in the water. So the other idea was, what if we were able to make the drone self-aware to identify the situation and then respond back when it, it detects, hey, there's a problem, we need to have emergency services out here immediately. That was the project and what we accomplished here. We took a drone and using a kayak, we took the kayak out into the sea and we had the drone identify the kayak and we were successful with that in terms of different types of weather. The next step was to take a life jacket and throw the life jacket out in the water and do the drone again, detecting the life jacket and understanding, you know, in different, in different depths of water below the life jacket uh, because of the, the color of the blue of the water or the green of the water differs in terms of depth. Uh, mm -hmm. When it's sunny out, when it's cloudy out, when it's raining out, all this information had to be captured. That was phase two. Phase three now, just because a life jacket is in the water doesn't mean that somebody's wearing it. So incorporating IR now to do a heat scan of the body mass that's inside of the water, which we were able to do. And again, all this is being done and trying to, in, in, in the attempt to keep compliancy in regards to the drone has to be at a certain altitude. The video that's being captured has to be at a certain megapixel, on and on and on. So going through this project, the final step was now that we have identification of the life jacket. We have identification mm -hmm. that there's a body inside of the life jacket. We have the environmental information in terms of sunny day, cloudy day, temperature it is outside, how rough is the water? Like we, we were able to capture all this information. We were then a rudimentary calculation of time till hypothermia was set in on this victim, which was huge because now you have this clock that says, hey, we've identified three bodies in the water. And here is mm -hmm. our best guess in terms of hyper when hyperthermia is going to set in uh, on these individuals. That was a big deal in terms of the accomplishment of this. What would happen in that scenario is the drone would fly out, it would capture that information. And instead of sending the video feed back, mm -hmm. it would send its results back to say, hey, in this coordinates, I detected this is the situation in terms of the life jackets and the people that are in it. And this is the, the clock that we're calculating in terms of time till hypothermia sets in sending that as a text file as opposed to sending it as a video file. Now the drone still had to go back, still had to upload its video feed and that whole bit.
but at least now they had an idea what was happening and can start organizing in the area the, the, the services to go out and rescue these individuals that were in the water. So what I was able to do is we can't obviously replicate that here only because I can't fly drones in my basement, <laughs> not mm -hmm. enough room. Uh, but what I, what I did want to do is I did want to go through and showcase to you how in building these solutions, they become transferable. And it's, I love the fact that we, we offer these up as open source because taking the same framework, we can build out other solutions, other tools uh, to help and enable other people. So an example of this, and this was with the help of the community, we'll, we built out a solution that can recognize tools. So instead of life jackets, we're using the custom vision AI workbench to build out a solution to recognize tools. So my first tool, I'm going to bring it up here. I'm going to add the images. Jay, what is this? That's a hammer. That's a hammer, right? How do you know it's a hammer, Jay? Um, I've hammered a lot of things. <laughs> well, okay, as have I, but in regards to the description of a hammer, what, what would, how would you describe a hammer? Uh, it's got a, a, a handle and some sort of like a mallet piece or, or a top piece that you, know, you use for striking. Right. So you have a blunt object that's at the end of a, of a long stick. Mm -hmm. uh, the long stick is your handle and the blunt object is what you hammer down with, right? Mm -hmm. So here's all the images that we have of hammers. Um, this was done manually. So I actually grabbed these images uh, through images.bing.com uh, and was able to you know, upload them into the, into the custom vision workbench. Uh, Jay, later on after the show, I'll share with you a great URL of, of a step-by-step -step, uh, instructional that was uh, provided by one of our uh, cloud advocates or one of one of our colleagues, Casey, um, mm -hmm. and she created a great solution that just extrapolates the information that you require in terms of imagery to train custom vision automatically. So you don't have to do the manual process that I did. And I'll share that with you after, after we're done. So yeah. as you can see, we have all these hammers here and we've added on the label of hammer. Uh, so tell, to tell custom vision that this is, a, a, this is a hammer. And Jay, what is the next tool that I've added to this? Uh, looks like you've added a wrench. Right. So again, we know this is a wrench because we're taught from a young age, you know, adjustable, non-adjustable. It's a metal object. Uh, it, it holds a hexadecimal or, or a hexagon type of uh, uh, bolt. And so this is the you know representation that we provided again through custom vision to showcase it. Hey, this is a wrench. And so we've taken this two images <clears throat> and we're adding it into custom vision to go and train itself to do the identification between a hammer and a wrench. And in doing so, we then get a recall percentage. So this percentage here at 96% accuracy, custom vision can detect the differences between a hammer and a wrench and identify each, each object, which is big. Once we've completed that, we export this data into a model file. Now, remember, Jay, we talked about the whole piece of the drone being out at sea. Mm -hmm. uh, connectivity would be over cellular. But in some scenarios, there's actually no cellular connectivity over uh, the ocean because of the fact we're flying three hours at, three hours at sea. So cellular wouldn't be an, a, an option in terms of connectivity. And in another scenario, you would say satellite. The challenge with satellite is it, too, has some issues in terms of uh, coverage over ocean. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you do have coverage over ocean, it's astronomically expensive to have that coverage for internet connectivity over the ocean. So what we actually did was, remember, we made the drone self-aware. This required us to export an Onyx file, which is an open source decision file, mm -hmm. if, to put it in rudimentary terms, to import this into the application and use this as the filter. Remember how we talked about the machine learning piece in terms of the workbench and the algorithm being your, your search or your desired search. Sure. Think of this model file as your desired search. So in the case of the life jackets, it was, I'm looking for the life jacket. Here's the information to identify a life jacket. In this demo here, this is the information to identify a wrench and a hammer. Sure. So the model is all the different uh, image predictive, uh, I guess, the information that the model has that states that a hammer looks like the following. That is the model. And then when you go through images and you are, are looking for a hammer, these are the elements that make up a hammer. I, I, I understand what you mean now. I, I yeah, it's, it's the attributes of what we've taught yeah. a custom vision to say, this is the object that you're detecting. 
So if I literally told Custom Vision a hammer is actually uh, a basket of fruit, and I keep training that, eventually if I keep showing baskets of fruit, it's going to say, no, these are hammers. Like, I understand what you put into it is what comes out. And this is why I was talking about, like, ethical AI before and, and how we, because we have to be certain that what we put into it is fully representative of all the information we're looking to get back. 100%. And that's the thing, right? Whatever you train AI to recognize or to uh, have as an outcome, it, it's going to provide that outcome. So it's got to remember garbage in, garbage out. You put good data in, you're going to get good data out, right? Absolutely. So let's continue on. So I'm taking this Onyx file and I'm exporting it. And Jay, you probably recognize this. This is a Unity uh, platform. So to build out applications on Unity. Um, mm -hmm you know build great games on unity but you can also use it to build out solutions on uh other other platforms as well uh so here's our model file here's our onyx model file that we've exported uh from the custom custom vision.ai workbench and we're actually going to take this ai model and we're going to put it into a hololens okay so i had a lot of help with this i did not code this myself this is something that was done via the community and it's the ability to then use the cameras on the hololens to recognize objects so you've trained it for hammers and wrenches. I've so trained it for a lot more than hammers and wrenches. The beauty of the, the compute power that's on the HoloLens actually allowed us to do recognition of 76 objects without oh, connectivity. Wow. Yes. That's big. It was pretty, it's pretty substantial. So let me show you the example. Uh, and here is a link to my GitHub repo that has the fork code uh, made available for you to go and, and try this out for yourself. Uh, and I'll show you another example that you don't really need a HoloLens. I had access to, to Gen 1 HoloLens uh, to accomplish this, uh, but you can do this on a plethora of devices as long as it has a uh, vision uh, uh, camera capability. Uh, I'm starting to work on a solution to port this over uh, to a Jetson NVIDIA device uh, using a, um, a, a 4K camera connected to the Jetson NVIDIA device to do recognition of the same objects, if not more, now that I have an even stronger compute uh, power beh uh, push behind it. So let me show you my example. So here's walking around with the HoloLens mm -hmm. and recognize that this, this is a basketball. And then it provides you the percentage in terms of its accuracy, in terms of its recall when you're looking at objects. Here's a soccer ball. And it could also shows you that there's other things that it could be as well uh, in terms of its prediction. It now knows that it's looking at a upright piano. And again, this is a HoloLens, no connectivity, mm. model file exported via Onyx into the device, recognizing through the camera the objects that it's looking at. <laughs> I like how it's like paper towels, table <laughs> lamp. That's really cool. Really and cool, You right? know what? And, and I actually can look at this as actually a really great uh, kind of tool for... Um, medical services this looks like it would just be so useful for things in in medicine now if you wanted to take it a step further beyond just optical recognition you can actually do uh recognition via ir as well and this solution here this is the azure connect sdk uh i don't know if you had um back in the day the xbox 360 with the connect uh i i had a 360. You, did you have the connect bar? I didn't have the connect okay. bar. I was like, I wasn't much into those like kind of like, I, I, I was playing, I think Madden the most at okay. that time or something like that. So I, I had the connect bar and it is a funny story behind that. So in Canada, the, the Microsoft Canada subsidiary uh, was running a tour across Canada called Tech Days. And mm -hmm. when the Xbox 360 came out uh, with the connect bar, we actually had that set up as a station at all the uh, Tech Days uh, deliveries across Canada, which I think was about uh, eight to 10 of them. And we were running boxing championships based on Connect Sports uh, that we'd have you know, people that of the audience come and participate and challenge myself or Rick Claus or Pierre uh, to, to boxing matches, which was really cool. That's fun. That same learning from the Connect for the 360 has now been created in the camera uh, that is available to connect to a, any computing source, so you can use the NVIDIA Jetson device or other devices that are out there, and not only provides you optical, but also provides you IR, uh, and as well as, uh, you know, it, it, IR, infrared, depth, you name it, all made available to you uh, for your analysis and for your um, understanding what's going on around you 
using the same model. So I can take that Onyx file, export it into a Jetson device, use the uh, camera made available uh, through the Azure uh, Azure Connect SDK, uh, and actually have the ability to do object recognition in an IR space as opposed to in an optical space. And I'll tell you why that's important. Uh, one of the other projects that I worked on talking about the whole aspect of ethics was with an organization called Home Accept. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to monitor people in their own homes of, you know, that, are, that require assistance uh, to learn and understand their living habits. You know, what time do they wake up in the morning? What time do they make lunch? What time do they feed their pet? What time do they watch their favorite show on, uh, on TV? All this information they wanted to capture and do a predictive analysis in terms of if that individual falls out of their normal day-to-day -day activities or day-to-day -day routine, are they in distress? Do they require assistance? The biggest challenge with this, aside from doing the learning of the, of the living habits of an individual, was the having a camera inside of somebody's home where the mm -hmm. information is pushing out to the cloud. What was actually accomplished was, instead of doing it via optical recognition, the information was being captured through infrared recognition. So the ability to use infrared technology to, to monitor a heat source moving throughout uh, a, a, a dwelling to understand the living habits of that heat source. So that's not a camera in your face, it's detecting you as a heat blob, but knows that that heat blob is you. And then the additional advantage of that is it, it monitors bodily temperature. So if you're up, if you're down, if you're having a fever, what have you, like, this is the information that's being captured through this other source that is not optical, but can recognize an actual object walking through a house, right? Now the, the, the uh, machine learning model behind this is proprietary unfortunately, but it, it is astronomically huge. Uh, there is a write-up in regards to the experiment or the, the project itself uh, based out of uh, Eastern Canada. So if you did want to read up on this. But again, what's awesome about this is the whole availability of, I can't use cameras because it's not ethically responsible to have this camera point at an individual inside of their own home. So mm -hmm. the utilization of IR uh, to recognize that that heat mass as an, as an individual and then still have that capability to track Again, based on their permission and them allowing you to do so of their daily living habits in their own home, uh, the initial proof of concept enabled a response when the individual was in distress via mobile device uh, to a loved one. Uh, future reiterations actually had the APIs made available to incorporate a digital assistant. So if you had an Alexa device uh, that would go in and, and, and be your response and say, hey, I noticed you haven't gotten up yet. Is everything okay? Hey, you know, it's been two hours since you've cooked dinner and your oven is still on. Is mm -hmm. everything okay? That availability through a voice response. Like my my father doesn't touch computers. So, you know, I think he just got a smartphone four years ago and he's still just using it as a rudimentary phone. He doesn't have, he has no interest of doing anything with it. Having that ability to have a voice uh, uh, to interact with as opposed to a screen, uh, hugely beneficial in regards to that whole I'm actually going to use this service as opposed to the medical alert bracelet. I'm just going to leave on the side because I don't want to wear it. Right. So it's it's that ability to understand the problem as a whole. We want to help, you know, these individuals that are, you know, they don't want to go to a living assisted uh, facility. They want to stay at home. They want to be empowered to do so. But mm -hmm. they also don't adopt or don't use technology. How do you help them? And so this is, again, going forward and understanding the problem or the opportunity first as opposed to just incorporating technology on top of it. Well, you know, that that's what we always try to do is we make sure that what we're doing makes sense when we build things. We don't want to just build things and not make them um, not accessible to uh, everybody. And, and I think that what we're doing is creating more and more products using things like AI to uh, make things more accessible, like being able to say to this, maybe a person who isn't the most technically able, um, hey, uh, whatever device, make the temperature 70 degrees. And then eventually when create uh, things like, say the nest, where it's actually predictive of what the temperature should be. So all these things are just huge. So Anthony, you really helped us take kind of a walk through all this. And I, I am super thankful for your time today. I, I had a lot of fun listening to you. Um, and I, I think that I learned a lot more about AI in this past week, just kind of going through the learn module, uh, going through uh, some of the stuff that I, I watched, and then obviously 
you just hit me with a ton of new info. Uh, it, it was really cool. Uh, Marcel, thank you very much for watching. It was really cool to have uh, this. Uh, and, and I know um, everybody is... Ooh. Sorry, but it is recorded, Mr. Pepper. Don't worry. Um, we are going to uh, have this on the Dev2 and the, the uh, show notes right away. Yep, no problem. Uh, so uh, this video and some show notes, some links that uh, Anthony is going to send me uh, will all be up on Dev.2 in just a few minutes. If you didn't get to see the whole show, it's always on YouTube. It will be there immediately if you want to reverse and see Anthony do some more stuff or if you just want to... I don't know. Look at our pretty faces. Anthony, <laughs> so much. Uh, I will see you when we can go places, but I'm happy to talk to you online, man. You're only an eight-hour drive away, so yeah, that'll be soon. <laughs> Hopefully Take soon. care. You too. Take Cheers. care, man. So that's that for this week. We had Anthony. He was super helpful for me to learn more about AI, machine learning, the cognitive services, you name it. Um, Y'all watching? Thank you very much. Uh, I always appreciate it and uh, hope we can do this again next week. Until then, it's your buddy Jay. And uh, I, I again say thank you for watching Azure Fun Bites. Uh, I just want to put up before we go, here is uh, the link referring to that uh, program for missing children that uh, Anthony mentioned earlier. You can go to that link and uh, check out the uh, repo about all that information relating to uh, the Missing Children Society of Canada. I really think that was an interesting part of all this. So anyway, we will catch you all. Oh, wait, do I have one more? Oh, and here's another link for Home Accept. Uh, that was also a super interesting kind of uh, thing that we got from Anthony. Let me get that for you. Home Accept also the uh, way of setting up that IR to uh, monitor the home it all goes into things like cosmos db that that's that's another fundamental part of azure which i think we're gonna get to maybe soon anyway uh i will catch you all very very soon um until then this is your buddy jay signing off <laughs>